Welcome everybody. My name is Teresa Parker and I'm one of the Quaker staff. Good afternoon. We'd like to welcome everybody to the first Quaker Peace and Social Witness Spring Session. This one's called Our Unstoppable Faith in Action. So welcome if you're feeling lively and energetic and welcome if your hope needs a boost. Welcome if you're excited to be part of this work and welcome if you're not sure whether this is for you. And also yeah, welcome if you need to eat your lunch and also welcome if members of your household make a sudden appearance unexpectedly. So just really want to give you a warm welcome to you and to those you carry in your heart. We've sent around a care and conduct statement to everyone. It sets out how each of us can create this space that we meet in. It's part of Quaker spiritual practice to recognize that everyone has love, goodness, truth inside. That said, of course, we make mistakes and we hurt each other sometimes. We may feel that love is oh so well hidden in some people at some times. And at those very times, we find that seeking what love can do among us and in our world is our chosen way. And to do this, we need to join together to be strategic, reflective, imaginative, and risk-taking. So this is the work that Quakers see the need for and that staff are tasked with doing. I'm going to show you a piece of art for our starters. Sometimes Quakers use art or music to aid reflection. You've just heard um, Labby Sifri's song, Something Inside So Strong. This picture is by Titus Kaffar. In the next five minutes, you might like to reflect individually on the picture in silence, or you might like to put any brief thoughts in the chat. There's a question, what, what is the picture about and what might it be saying to you? Thank you, friends. Um, much appreciate all of your um, reflections in the chat there. Just going to say a little bit about this session now. Um, we're going to have an overview of uh, the work of Quaker Peace and Social Witness. Uh, we're going to have uh, some uh, time for questions and answers after that. Then there'll be uh, a very short break, followed by a question and a, some input on how do we know the work is spirit-led? There'll be some time to talk about that in small groups afterwards. And we'll have some worship sharing following that, some sharing into the silence. I'm looking forward to it all. Can I now introduce you to Claire Wood? She's a member of staff. She's going to give an overview of the work of Quaker Peace and Social Witness and this is one of the ways that Quakers put their faith, which is their confidence in love, into action. And after about 15 minutes, we'll have time for some questions. So you could, if you want, add any questions in the chat as we go along. Claire. Thank you, Teresa. Hi, friends. It's lovely to be here with you all. Um, so as Teresa said, I'm going to try to give you an overview of all the work of QPSW. Um, it's going to be a bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, so as Teresa says, we'll try and make a bit of time for questions at the end, but I'm also really happy to hear from people afterwards. 
and we'll be sharing some um, ways you can stay in touch at the end. And um, Phil, I don't, I don't think I've got access to the slides. So Phil, could you um, put up the slides to go with my talk? That would be great. I'll just hang on, there we go, thank you. So um, I think many of you might know QPSW and our work, but just in case not everybody does, I'll briefly say who and what we are. So QPSW is one department of Britain Yearly Meeting, and that's a centrally organised body of Quakers in Britain. There are about 21 of us at the moment, but we've got lots of part-time staff, so we add up to about 15 full-time people. And what I've put up on the screens here is the vision and objectives for our new five-year strategy. Um, you can also find a longer and sort of longer standing description of the role of QPSW in Quaker faith and practice as well. Um, and I'll just read out this first part. So guided by the spirit, our vision is of a peaceful and sustainable future built on just relationships between people and with the earth. So though the focus is on peace and sustainability, we're really clear that we need to work on them in a way that prioritizes justice and equality too. As some of our colleagues talk about something called a just peace, it's a concept you might have heard of. And that means attending to the underlying inequalities and inequities that create the conditions for violence and injustice. And for us, that means doing work that prioritizes both structural, structural so kind of the rules and the organizations and the cultures that we set for ourselves and the personal, so the hearts and minds. Um, as you can see, this vision is quite broad and challenging. Um, and so that's where our committees come in to help us to prioritize the work that QPSW can do and where we can best place our energy. Um, Phil, could I, could I have the next slide? So this is just a snapshot of the current work. Um, I wanted to show you this before showing you a, a bit of more of a complicated diagram of how the work can connect. And I hope this will give you a sense of scale. At the moment, we have these 10 programmes or pieces of work. Um, on the right are our international programmes and on the left, broadly, our Britain-based work, although um, much of it connects um, internationally and some of our grants, for example, are, are internationally focused. So I just wanted to point out a couple of things on this slide that I think are interesting. Um, the pieces of work on the left have arisen mainly through the Quaker process that you may be familiar with, where local friends will test concerns locally, it might be adopted by their area meeting, and then on to meeting for sufferings who may then ask QPSW to take it on. Um, the international work's a bit different in that Quakers have been invited or asked to share their experience and then have discerned that it's something we can do. So I think this has been a really interesting challenge for us is how we can have a strategy and a structure that allows us to put energy into important opportunities as they arise and be responsive in this very challenging time. Um, but whilst also recognizing that the changes we want to make are really hard and we need to commit to pieces of work for the long haul. Many of these pieces of work here we've been working on for a very long time. Another thing to point out is that it is a lot of different areas for a relatively small team and we're increasingly trying to find ways to work more collaboratively um, and in effect to be more than the sum of our parts. So for example, um, we are part of a steering group of something called Build Back Better, which is a campaign which is pushing for a, a more fair and sustainable recovery from the pandemic. And that's something that's involved staff from across QPSW. So I'm going to show you now this diagram. This diagram is hot off the press. Um, <laughs> it's slightly complicated, so I will talk you through it. Um, so the context is at the top in red. Um, and then the Quaker discernment, I guess, is a kind of a filter. And then you can see those are our approaches, skills building and education, partnerships and movement building, community led peace building and political and institutional change and then some pieces of work at the bottom in blue. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit more detail to hopefully bring, bring that to life. Um, during the strategy process, so our central committee and our subcommittees and staff did a contextual analysis. And you can see some of the issues they identified in, in red at the top there. <clears throat> I'm going to just read you an excerpt from the strategy because I think it explains it well. 
and this is, this is from the contextual analysis part of the strategy. We see extreme inequalities, reduction in biodiversity and environmental destruction caused by an economic system that exploits people, the earth and its other inhabitants. This system is upheld by institutions and hierarchies which have historically, historically benefited from it and which often discriminate on grounds such as, but not limited to race, class and gender. Around the world, we've seen a rise in overt racism, nationalism and anti-migrant sentiment fueled by populist public figures. We see the weaponization of language in social and mass media becoming a potent force for narrowing the us and dehumanizing the other. The effects of large scale injustice are measured in generations, not years. And many of today's armed conflicts and imbalances of power and wealth are linked directly to the ongoing impact of colonialism. And it goes on to talk about different forms of violence, the role of the UK arms industry, industry um, but it also recognises that there are opportunities, so more nonviolent movements emerging, a green economy being more part of a mainstream discourse, and more people, especially young people, being politically active and engaged. But alongside all of this, um, the committee acknowledged that the full impact of COVID pandemic is, is really yet to become clear, but we know that almost everything has been impacted. So just moving on down the diagram a little bit <clears throat> to those four, whatever they are, I haven't quite worked out yet. Um, let's, let's call them roots. I'm not sure they're quite roots. Um, one of the things that became really clear during the strategy process is that how we do things are as important as what we do. So in the middle there, you'll see the four approaches that our committees prioritised. And under each, we've given, we've given some examples. Um, it's not, in fact, quite that neat. Many of the programmes or projects will use every approach. So start here, but as part of our new strategy, the committee have asked us to think about how we might embed or support community-led peace building more in Britain too. <clears throat> and community-led peace building can be lots of things. Um, and Quakers currently use different approaches in all of our three international programmes. So I'll just give you a bit more detail about some of those. Phil, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, you may well know, this is one of our more well-known programmes, um, EAPI, Ecumenical Accompaniment Programme in Palestine and Israel. So this is part of an international programme run by the World Council of Churches. Um, we do the, the British and I Irish part of it, but there are 22 countries involved. And we use a model known as accompaniment, and that uses international humanitarian law as its basis. And we train volunteers to live and work alongside communities and to record and report on human rights violations. Then when they return home, they work with us to advocate for change and to share the voices and stories of Palestinians and Israelis, again, using um, an international humanitarian law framing and pointing out where what they see on the ground is, is not in accordance with human rights. Um, it's community led in the sense that Palestinian churches put out a call for international churches to come and witness the occupation in the first place. And Palestinians and Israelis form a governance group that shapes the work, what it is and where it is. And the programme for the last few years has been thinking about how to decolonise the work. You saw um, that part of the central, our central committee strategy at the top in the red, one of the issues that we felt was important to address was kind of colonial legacies. And, and we're thinking about this in lots of our work. So in this programme, that, that has meant so far things like embedding power and privilege and anti-Semitism training um, for our companies, looking at how we can address the power imbalances between the Global South and Global North countries involved in the programme. And also more recently since the pandemic, thinking about whether it could be possible for Palestinians to serve as accompaniers too. Um, going back to different community-led peace building approaches. So we have a small piece of work in South Asia. I don't have a slide for that because this is quiet work. It's not something that we publicize widely. It's, it's very sensitive work, but Quakers are using a conciliation approach there to support this sensitive peace process. And, and in that work as well, we're very responsive. Uh, we listen to, to requests and, and essentially provide any support that we can. Um, this work is interesting in that 
mainly the staff are not doing the work. It is the Quaker governance group that are doing the work themselves. They are a group of experienced conciliators. And that support can take the form of anything that's requested from a physical presence during negotiations, monitoring of the news, letter writing, to being simply upheld through communication and, and prayer. Phil, could you, could you show the next slide? Thank you. And um, I've just got another, another EP slide here. So this is our company as, sorry, the previous slide was a, a checkpoint. So Palestinians waiting to go through into Israel for their daily work. And this slide is, um, our company is walking children to school, which is one of the regular things that they do. Uh, next slide, please, Phil. So this is our other bit of international work. <clears throat> and again, using a different, a different approach. So in 2010, after post-election violence, Kenyan Quakers asked QPSW's Turning the Tide programme to share its approaches to non-violent campaigning. And Kenyan peace builders really took that training and made it relevant to the Kenyan context and have now set up programmes in Rwanda and Burundi. And so, and so have a kind of regional network. And the work combines really active peace building, so building the skills and commitment to peace. Um, so, for example, setting up peace clubs in Burundian schools with nonviolent campaigning, so standing up to injustice. And it's got this really strong focus on learning and networking. So we now would really like to learn more from this work as we develop what we're doing in Britain. And um, next slide, please, Phil. Coming back to that diagram, or just thinking about that diagram again, and another approach, one of those approaches was partnerships and movement building. So in almost all of our work, we work as part of coalitions and movements. We try to signpost friends to other organisations as well as doing our own work. And we also give space to and convene many networks, um, especially within the peace movement, but across all of our work. And when we can, we place young professionals as peace workers in other peace organisations too. So to give you an example, our economics and sustainability team at the moment are preparing for the UN climate conference in Glasgow in November with the hope that Quakers will have a presence at the event, but will also take action around Britain. And to do this, we're in regular contact with the Quaker United Nations office and with friends from the West of Scotland area meeting. But we're also playing a, a really central role in coordinating a faith task group. And we hope that that will then lead to more ongoing interfaith work on climate. And, and just to reiterate that we are small and we're trying to make big changes. So being engaged in, or starting up or supporting networks and movements is really important for us. And in that way, we can learn from others and, and often have more of an impact. And uh, next slide, please, Bill. So, so skills building and education, coming back to those approaches. Across all of our work, we support friends who want to take action on their concerns. So we provide training, resources, newsletters, guidance and briefings for engaging with policymakers and then more tailored support where we can. Um, our Turning the Tide programme in particular helps friends to think about how to take effective action using the skills and experience that Quakers have of non-violence. Um, and we have a peace education programme, and I think this is a really important way that Quakers are contributing to peace. So we have a team of two who provide training and resources for teachers, but also work with education institutions, teacher training institutions and charities to try to embed peace education more widely into the system. Um, and when we say peace education, we mean building the skills for inner peace, building peace between us. So, for example, peer mediation and building skills for critical thinking about peace in the wider world. So supporting critical analysis on war, violence and peace. Um, but again, it's an example of employing many of the four approaches. So the peace education team also convene networks of peace educators. They also support many active friends and they also do policy work. And the final approach, sorry, next slide, please, Phil. Um, you may know that, that Quakers have sort of long worked for political change um, and have been effective um, in, in some ways and made substantial changes on occasion, but more often we're part of a movement or a coalition that is advocating for change. Um, so wherever possible, we build relationships with decision makers to try to influence them to create and uphold sustainable and peaceful policies. Um, but at other times, as you can imagine, um, 
depending on who's in power, so especially at the moment, we need to put pressure on and we might do this by working with others to protest or lobby or push for change in different ways. And whenever possible, we'll do this in collaboration with Quakers, sharing ideas about what it might be useful to say to politicians on a particular issue, providing training and support for how to engage in, in a constructive way. So just a few examples from recent years, working with partners, we've worked on welfare raw, welfare reform, the rights of prisoners, the immigration bill, Palestinian statehood, Israeli settlement goods. Um, Quakers were a key part of a movement to get big institutions to divest from fossil fuels. Um, and one of our staff members made really substantial contributions to ensuring that there was a strong civil society voice during the negotiation of the nuclear weapons ban treaty um, in 2017, which I think has been agreed by 122 states and is a really major milestone for the nuclear disarmament movement. So we see political advocacy as an important role and approach for us as we, as we look ahead in this really challenging context. Um, and the final slide, thanks, Bill. So just coming back to this slide, um, looking at the blue watery bit at the bottom, I haven't mentioned the sanctuary programme. Um, you can see it under partnerships and movement building here. And again, it uses many of these approaches. Um, so I want to just mention this briefly. It was a, it was a three year programme which we set up to respond to the migration crisis and the punitive and violent response by the government and also in response to a lot of concern from Quakers. And in the end, it's carried on for an extra year funded by, by Quakers um, and it's due to end this year. It was a legacy, it was funded by Quaker Legacy. So it was always going to be a time bound thing. But it took a really interesting approach, I think, of setting up a network to support something that many Quakers were already involved in. So it kind of offers an umbrella for Quakers who are working on sanctuary, migration and asylum. Um, and it's done this in conjunction with Quan, the Quaker Asylum and Refugee Network. So then by becoming a sanctuary meeting, um, that, was, that was the kind of generic name given to meetings who wanted to sign up to be part of this network. Friends and meetings could then access extra tra training and support and they could connect to and draw inspiration from each other. And then they could do collaborative projects too if they wanted to. Um, it's really sad it's coming to an end, but I, I hope we can keep some aspects of the work going. So this is one of the programmes that brought a racial justice lens into the work. And um, though other programmes are increasingly doing that. Um, so it provides training on power and privilege and racial justice for friends. It's helped its Quaker committee to welcome experts by experience onto the committee. So they are Quakers and non-Quakers who are directly affected by the asylum system. And the committee have done their own training around racial justice and privilege and, and have thought very hard about how to attend to power imbalances in their meetings and processes. So there's a lot for us to learn from this programme in our work and as a team and in our governance bodies. And just coming back to the strategy, something that um, we were really keen to attend to over the next five years is, is an understanding that violence, the climate crisis, migration, racism, oppression, poverty and inequality are all linked. And we want to point that out in our work and we want to highlight those connections and not silo ourselves into the kind of individual problems that we see in the world. So yeah, the work's changing um, and exci it's exciting, but it's also challenging and, and hard for staff and committees um, to decide what to do and how to respond in this really challenging context. And we'll keep sharing our work with you and we'll, we'll share with you later, we'll put up a slide later that, that shows you ways you can stay in touch and hear about the work. Um, and I just want to finish by saying this is your work. Um, that This work has come to us through Quakers. Quakers guide the work, so we really hope you'll engage it, with it share it, join our committees and help to shape it. Thank you, I will stop there and I will see if there's any questions in the chat and, and do feel free to put questions up. I think we've just got a few minutes. Thank you, Jill. Um, I noticed the Peace Worker programme is not on the list. Um, do you, I think you might mean the list of um, the 10, the slide where I put up the 10 programmes. Um, apologies, I, I 
probably in my head combine that with the peace and disarmament program because it's really closely attached to that work and um, the peace worker program we're not running it this year and um, we haven't been able to because of financial reasons um but it's certainly something that the committee wants to keep doing it's a really important contribution to the peace movement so i i hope we will be able to keep running it it has had a big impact on many people's lives and um, just very briefly for those of you that don't know it so um the peace worker program we place mainly young professionals or people at an earlier stage in their career into often very small under-resourced peace organizations to do a very specific piece of work that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do and in that way we hope that the individual builds their skills and commitment to peace and also that that, bit, that organization can do a bit of work it wouldn't otherwise have been able to do so I, I think it's a really brilliant bit of work thank you Jill thank you Gerard so just in case people aren't seeing the chat um Gerard said we've just set up an area-wide QPSWE networking group. It will be interesting to see how we link with QPSW at a national level. I, that would be really great. I think one of the questions for us is um, building on the sanctuary meetings model, how we could keep helping Quakers to network with each other. So as well as kind of connecting to us and, and us responding where we can, but how we can help Quakers to find out where Quakers in other parts of the country share their concerns and are doing work and, and we can be a kind of, um, have a connecting role there. So I think networking is something we really will be trying to do more of. If any other staff want to jump in, I know there's a few staff here, <laughs> feel free to answer questions as well. Yeah, just to say on that, um, we're covering very much the same issues you're covering. And the, the issue is also how to focus down and how to identify concrete areas where we can make a change. And so it'll be very good to, I, I find that really interesting, the, uh, the model that you put up and how we can dialogue with QPSW international, nationally rather, uh, and indeed internationally to um, add um, weight and uh, additional campaigning at an area and local level, because it's quite challenging. And as you say, you've said challenging a lot. And I think especially with COVID, um, it's been very challenging. So that's why I would look forward to having an ongoing exchange um, locally regionally and nationally. Um, and I'll just say one more thing that we ran an Amnesty International group many years ago um, in Banbury and we became kind of experts in Poland on um, human rights uh, issues for the national Amnesty International. So I wonder whether QPSW nationally could consider regional or local meetings to help forward specific issues and to take a lead sometimes in those issues so that it's a two-way campaigning street. I just leave that with you, but it's, it worked very well mm -hmm. and it gave more resources to national Amnesty International to have these local groups take on specific um, geographical areas and gain a lot of expertise. Thank you, thank you, Gerard. I think just to respond to your first bit briefly, we are really, really keen for friends and groups of friends to be, you know, calling on us, drawing on us, supporting us, yeah, asking stuff of us. So I'd love to have a conversation with you about that. And I know a lot of my colleagues would um, at that more strategic level, as well as the sort of more specific stuff, because it does sound like we're grappling with some of the same stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I think networking and, and being able to find experience where it lies and not assuming that we have to do it all and we're small and we can't do it all anyway, is <laughs> not making the best use of our collective resources across Quakers. So I think, yeah, that's, that's definitely 
something we would like to do more of. We haven't quite worked it out to yet. And also the wonderful Lindsay is part of our meeting. So oh. <laughs> added advantage. <laughs> Lindsay's our turning the tide coordinator and, and yeah, they're great. Um, Teresa, do I have time to answer one last question? No, do you want to move on? Um, I think we probably should move on if that's okay. What we do next is we're going to have um, Anne Bettis uh, talk to us, with us, about how we know our work is spirit-led. So Anne serves on one of the committees who discerns what we do to put love into action. And we'll have um, some words from Anne, and then there's going to be um, some period of small group work so that you can talk about these ideas and those ideas of your own and examples that you have of putting love into action. So over to you, Anne. Thanks very much, Teresa. And uh, it's lovely to see you all. Lots of familiar faces and lots of new faces. It's really nice to see you. And uh, thanks very much for the Labby Sifri. I really enjoyed that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, I've been on uh, QPSW Central Committee. Uh, this is my fifth year. And it's been an absolute uh, privilege and a joy to serve on that committee, to find out about all the amazing work that's done in our name and to get to know the staff and the work that they're doing. QPSW's work is done on behalf of Quakers in Britain. Guided by the spirit, our vision is of a peaceful and sustainable future built on just relationships between people and with the earth. How do we get to that peaceful and sustainable future? We're living in quite unusual times, troubled times, a time of crisis, of crises, we see the environmental crisis, environmental destruction and loss of biodiversity. We see division and polarization of views, extreme inequalities and poverty, a rise in racism, nationalism. There's much to do in the world. This has been a traumatic year for so many of us and we don't yet know what impact that trauma is going to have on us in the future. We don't know what opportunities will open up for us, but we want to be ready to take them. Some of our work's been evolving over many years. Some of it is new. We want to be able to support Quakers in their witness. We want to be flexible enough to respond to change, to work alongside other groups and individuals, to speak truth with power. How do we know our work is spirit-led? What do we mean by spirit-led? Maybe a better question to ask is, what does love require of me? What does love require of us? Being part of a Quaker community means that it's not what we do, it's the way that we do it. The way that we make decisions together is significant. We need to hold on to those particular aspects of decision-making that allow us to feel unity with a decision, a process of reflection and discernment. In our meetings, we allow time and space to listen to one another. We try to be well informed. We choose our words carefully. We respond to what's going on in the world around us. We write our minutes in the meeting, in the moment, and share those so that we can agree that a sense of the meeting has been found, that we have to invest in the time to do this well. Quakers are a bottom-up religion. An individual or a group may have what we call a concern, a strong leading, a passion to work on a particular issue. They test this with their local group to get the support of the meeting. That work may stay local or the leading may be taken to the wider group of friends at an area meeting and then on to Britain yearly meeting. That was my own experience. Um, before 2009, I'd heard Craig Barnett talk about City of Sanctuary in Sheffield. And I'd been working with asylum seekers and I knew that this would be something that Huddersfield would really like to do. So I first went to our own meeting to ask for the support to set up a, a town of sanctuary in Huddersfield to welcome asylum seekers into our communities. Then I went to the Interfaith Council to get their support and they offered their support. From there on, we set up introductory meetings to see who in Huddersfield 
might want to support us and get on and get a City of Sanctuary movement going within our local area. So Huddersfield Town of Sanctuary was set up, now Sanctuary Kirklees, but it was a support of my local meeting and feeling held by that that enabled me to go forward. The City of Sanctuary movement has grown. Quakers and Quaker meetings were early supporters. Now there are many Sanctuary meetings across the country and they have been supported by our Sanctuary Everywhere member of staff. Our meeting for business method, meetings for church affairs method, is a gift that Quakers have been working with for over 300 years. Our central committee meetings are held in this way with periods of worship woven in. This is a process which takes time. It's important to build in space for friends to speak, to think, to listen. listen to, listening to one another is crucial. Being open to another way. These quiet ways of working mean that Quakers are experienced at bringing people together, listening, using quiet processes, dialogue, QPSW's work reflects this. When have you experienced a decision that you felt was made, well made and what facilitated that? The basis of our unstoppable faith in action is our lives as a Quaker community, worshipping together. In stillness, in thoughtful reflection, being well informed about what's going on in the world, seeing that of God in everyone, out of that place, and with our testimonies to peace and equality comes our action, our witness in the world, our unstoppable faith in action. Thank you so much, Anne. There are many questions which I think Anne has um, pulled out for us there. What does love require of me? Um, where what does being spirit led mean? I think really you can you can choose your own question <laughs> to talk about in in the small groups. Because I think it's you know part of being spirit led is that we listen to the each each other's own direct experience and own thoughts. And so I don't want to set questions for you to consider. I want you to have a more open and um, perhaps deeper conversation than you might. Otherwise, if you feel constrained by, you know, sitting with a, a particular question, you might have an example that you can share that, that feels like you put love into action. So we're going to have about 25 minutes for this because I want to give you, you know, enough time. After that, we're not, we're not going to feed back in a traditional way. We're going to feed back in a, in a sort of sharing into the silence. Quakers call this a worship sharing, but um, we have probably people who are not, um, for whom worship is not the easiest word. Um, and so we would probably say, we hold a period of quiet um, and into the silence, uh, you can add voice your own brief reflection, a thought or a feeling. So, but first uh, let's get, uh, let's move into the small groups and um, have a chance to, you know, get them to go. That would be great. Thank you so much. So welcome back. So that was a very um, rich talk that we had from Anne Bettis. And um, we're now going to go into um, just just about 10 minutes of uh, sharing into the silence. And for those that haven't done this before, let me explain. So we'll hold a reflective space among us for, for about 10, 12 minutes. And into the quietness, anybody can voice a brief reflection or a thought or feeling. And usually we leave a bit of space between the contributions so that they have a chance to settle. So you'll need to unmute yourself if you want to speak. And um, 
you know, we'll, we'll um, take that now. And I think, I think, yes, we've got 10 minutes. Thank you, friends. Well, we're close to the end of our session this lunchtime. It's been good to sit together and share what love requires of us and how Quaker Peace and, Witness, Quaker Peace and Social Witness puts just that confidence that we have in love into action, be it in a host of ways, which I certainly heard about in the group I was part of. There's um, five more sessions which go into more detail about specific areas of the work. And all of the staff that you'll hear from consider that Quakers as a whole own all that we do. And as staff, we just so greatly involve, value being involved in it. I don't know if um, Claire or Anne or Phil, um, Phil's been doing all the technology, by the way, just to say that, um, have any closing remarks uh, they would like to make? Teresa, just a really practical thing. Um, Phil, if, if um, you could share the slide with ways to stay in touch, um, because there's lots of different ways that we, we update friends on the work, also what we want to hear from you. I just had a really brilliant example um, about a young friend doing a Black Lives Matter poster. So we really love to hear that stuff too, and we can then share it onwards if people are willing. So yeah, please, please stay in touch with us. Thanks, Rita. Mm. Good, good, good point, Claire. Okay. Sorry, it didn't quite get to be ministry, but um, uh, when we, I was in John's group talking about the prophets and reconcilers, but I also like the idea that over many decades or hundreds of years, Quakers have been a nuisance to people. Um, so I think that's what we need to carry on doing. Be All of you, be a nuisance to people. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. <laughs> uh, we obviously have um, an evaluation um, of this session, um, as we will of all sessions. And uh, really the, uh, the work that we do to put these sessions together is often very much based on previous uh, sessions that we've run of a similar nature. So all the information that you can give us is really helpful uh, in the next pieces of work. On this, um, this link, Phil's going to keep it open for about 30 minutes uh, for networking. So you can just uh, stay online and talk with others um, as you wish for the next half an hour. So I just want to say many thanks. Uh, much appreciated uh, your participation in this session. And um, I just say goodbye. <laughs>